I'm Laurel Zuckerman. Thank you very much for joining this session on a computational approach to detecting Nazi looted art. Um, this unhappy lady strapped to the chair basically sums up the approach. Uh, various uh, bodily functions are being measured, her pulse probably, her blood pressure, maybe the moisture on the palm of her hands. And this serious looking guy in the corner is writing it all down. And that's basically what we're gonna do. The only difference is that instead of looking at a person, we're gonna look at the provenances of artworks. Now the art that interests me is the art that changed hands from 1933 to 1945. And as you know, um, the Nazis engaged in massive looting, the greatest looting campaign in the history of the world. And they targeted, uh, in particular, uh, Jewish individuals, expropriating them and um, uh, murdering them. And today we are left with a legacy of a huge volume of artworks that um, still need to be verified. There are provenance gaps, and there's a lot of false information. And to deal with this, we have very limited resources. So it's a matter of setting priorities. So an obvious question is, how do we set those priorities? What can we do to automate because we have limited resources? Now, the way I got involved in this question was due to my own personal um, history. In, 19, in 2004, I found on the website of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a Picasso called The Actor, that had belonged to my family in Cologne before Hitler came to power. It hung in the dining room of my great grand uncle, Paul Lefman. You see that photo of the dining room on the left. And when I discovered the artwork, I was surprised to see that it had a false provenance. And the more we researched the provenance of this painting, the more false provenances we found going all the way back to 1938. And these provenances were created by a lot of different people. And there were a lot of different stories, all of them false, that were being told by these different people at different times. And these false versions were eventually debunked by the discovery of archival documents. The part that interests me in connection with the talk today is what happened after I started asking questions in 2004. And I wanna draw your attention to, first of all, the size of these boxes, and secondly, to the words that are in red, private, the question mark, circa, or probably, likely. Uh, these are words that caught my attention. And I wondered, is it possible to make an abstraction of all the different stories that are being told and just focus on these kinds of words. You can count them, for example, and you can see the trends in uh, their frequency. I wondered, is this the only artwork that has this kind of evolution in these kinds of words? I, I think about them as words of confusion or words of deception. Words, for example, um, that I think can be classified in three different big groups. Words of anonymity, that is, it looks like it's saying something, but actually it confers no information about who owned the painting. Of uncertainty, which actually is often a cover for simply speculation on the part of the author that's not actually justified by archival documents or sources. And unreliability, that is approximations by um, uh, words that indicate that one does not have a sales document with a precise date uh, documenting a transaction. Now, why are these kind of words important? I think they are because traditional signs of um, Nazi looted art that we look for are red flag names. Uh, for example, there were a thousand names that were inventoried in 1946 uh, of people of individuals who had somehow been involved in the Nazi uh, looted art trade. Uh, those are red flag names. Or names of Jewish art collectors who had been persecuted by Nazis or provenance gaps. 
And so people look for those things in provenances. However, my own personal experience indicated that quite often these provenances uh, omit these names or falsify them. Names might have been erased, false names might have been added, dates, places, events might be erroneous, gaps might have been concealed, and speculation and theories might add confusion. So if you just trust the provenance, the words in the provenance, you're in trouble. So how can you tell if a provenance is being deceptive? Well, in 2020 and in 2021, a team of volunteers at Two Swiss Glam Hacks got together and created a little tool simply to count words. The data set that we used was one that was taken from the public Nazi-era provenance internet portal. Uh, it was 21,000 artworks. Those didn't have provenance. And so to enhance that data set, I went and got the provenance from various art museums. So it's an enhanced data set from NEPIP. And this is one of our team members who did a lot of the coding, who's going to explain how it works. This is Ray Naller. Um, the, the specific artworks that the tool was designed to look at are ones that were created before 1945 and entered collections after 1933. Um, and the indicators that um, the tool scans for are around uncertainty, unreliability, and, and anonymity. So we believe that this probably belonged to a lady in a private collection. That's that kind of language. Um, and also red flags, which are um, names either of known Nazi looters, um, of Jewish collectors who are known to have been plundered or murdered, or um, art dealers who are known to have been involved in at least one dodgy art deal of elusive work. Um, having given you some background, I'll just go through how this works quickly. Um, you, I have a CSV file, which I... Okay, I'm gonna take over from her here and do a live demo. Um, this is the eluded art detector. So we're going to enter in the name of the column with the information we want to analyze. We're gonna upload a CSV file that contains the provinces or whatever else we wanna have analyzed. And we're either going to hit enter at that point or um, upload a default indicator file. So the file that I'm gonna use for the demo is a data set based on NEPIP that comes from the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, with provenance that date from 2020. And this is simply the file. So one downloads your file, that is whatever file you happen to have, you download your CSV file, okay? I'm also going to use custom indicators. And the custom indicators are very simple. It's just two columns. The column with the word simply contains whatever it is you want to have counted. And you can change this file and do what you want with it, put whatever words you want in it. And the type of flag, that's how you're going to group them. So for example, I'm going to group all of these names here into flag, that's art looting investigative unit, red flag name. Um, I'm going to group these words here into anonymity. And I'm going to group these words here. These are the names of some people who were plundered into a flag plundered. So if their name appears, it'll be counted. And these into reliability and so on. And these are people who are involved in restitution cases. So um, you download this file as well, you just download your CSV. And then you go into your looted art detector and I'm going to upload the files. So first I'm gonna take the column name was provenance. It could have a different column name. You, you put in whatever that happens to be. The data file is MFA NEPIP. So I'm gonna pull that into the CSV file to analyze. And the word flag file, which you saw, that's the two column file, I'm gonna put into my custom indicators, okay? I'm gonna run it. I just click, it works a little bit, and then it's going to, oh, you see that little file? It just downloaded a file, which is results 20. So what you do then is you just pull that file into whatever software you happen to be using. Um, here, I'm just using uh, Google Sheets, but whatever you, you might be using Excel or something else. And the file that it's going to give you
is the same file that you uploaded plus some additional information. So this is the file that you uploaded here, you, the same file. And then adding to it are a bunch of counts. It's just counting everything that I asked it to count. I'm gonna reformat that here as a uh, number, okay? Now I'm gonna go into a formatted file to make the demo a little bit easier. This is the same file, but it's formatted. So how do you use it? So I put on a filter so that I can search. The most basic way to use it is simply to say, show me the artworks that have the most uncertainty flags. So this one, whatever it is, has the most uncertainty flags. I can also see that it has a certain number of other flags, restitution flags, plundered flags, et cetera. I'm going to look and see what it is. It happens to be portrait of a man and a woman in an interior. So let's look and see why it picked this up. It's this painting right here in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And if you look at it, you can see pretty quickly why um, it picked this one up. It's by 1934, which is approximate. It has the name of a Jewish art collector um, who was um, persecuted. Um, it has uh, a gallery owner who was involved in several cases, but I had asked it to look only for uncertainty flags. And so if you look at the text, you'll see um, some probablys or some, some likelies or some um, various uncertainty language. And if you go down to the bottom, you'll see that in fact, there was a financial settlement uh, with the heirs of Walter Westfield. Now, another way that you could look um, is to look, for example, at restitution flags. So I'm gonna look at artworks that had the most, right? here's one that has 13 restitution flags, that is people who, for whatever reason, were named in restitution cases, but you'll see that it also has some other flags. So we look at this one. Um, this is going to be St. Andrew. Um, that's, it looks like this. And if you look at the provenance, you'll see that, well, first of all, you see that even though we weren't looking for unreliability, we're seeing unreliability words, um, but we're gonna see names that were involved in restitution cases, Pinakos, Heinemann. Um, and if you look down in the text, um, you'll see that in fact, there was a Leo Goldberger. We weren't looking necessarily for Leo Goldberger, but we're gonna see that there's a Leo Goldberger who was sent to a concentration camp and died of starvation after it was looted. And there's still some question about this. So we weren't looking for him specifically. We were just looking for certain kinds of flags. Um, the One can do the same thing with, with other sorts of flags. For example, if I look at plundered, um, we already saw actually that first one. That's again, that um, a portrait of an interior. Let's look at the second one on the list. Woman seated in a bed. That's this lady here. And if we look at her provenance, um, actually we see that it was confiscated by the finance ministry. Well, in these cases, it's picking up things that we know uh, were already, um, that we know were looted. But if you go down the list, you'll find things that we don't know were looted, but have the same kind of language. Um, you can also, of course, mix and match these sort of things. You could say, I want to have a high concentration of uncertainty language, and I want to um, have, for example, this gentleman, Frederick Mont, who's been involved in so many cases. And you'll see a very interesting selection of items uh, with him, all of which should be checked very, very carefully because um, because that's a lot of uh, flags that should be checked. So that's basically the idea of, of how this works. Uh, on the Open Art Data website, you can see instructions for it, you can get links to the detector, and you can get some uh, data sets to work with. So the point here is the power of counting. All we're doing is counting. And because we're counting, if, for example, we have different spellings and we know the different variations of the spellings, we can put them all in. 
if you're not interested in Nazi looted art, but instead what you're interested in loot is, is looted antiquities, you would put names like Latchford or Wiener or Shelby White uh, in to the into the um, um, the custom indicator file. You can put in whatever you want, and it's simply going to count it for you. So there's a lot of different ways that you can count. Uh, you can count using buoyant whitelists, which is also just a list-based thing. Uh, you can count actually even using chat GPT advanced data analysis without any code. You can just tell it to count stuff. And if you're a programmer, you can count in R and Python. There are many different tools that will enable you to count. So what are the results that we see of, of this kind of method? Um, well, first of all, there is no code. Absolutely anybody can do this. It's very, very easy. And you can do it on any data set. Uh, it doesn't have to be provenance. It could be references, for example, or credit line. It's transparent. It's not black box like named entity recognition. We did some ex experiments with that, which gave interesting results, but they but sometimes we couldn't understand the results. But it's also a blunt tool. For example, one of the um, red flag names is a guy named Ball. And so Ball is in the list, but that will also pick up um, Kimball or um, names that end with Ball. So you have to be cognizant of the fact that it's really a, a blunt tool. It's useful to add a, calculations to it. So uh, for example, if you just do uncertainty flags, um, you might, you're gonna get more uncertainty flags probably for a very old artwork than you are for a newer artwork. And so it could be good to normalize by dividing that by the number of words, which I would call an uncertainty index. Uh, there are other calculations that you can do. One of the big advantages of such an approach is that it simply removes emotion, it removes subjectivity, it removes opinions. It's an entirely objective number that you're coming up with. Uh, there's a possibility of in detecting intention through patterns, uh, through the pattern in the use of deceptive words over time at specific moments, um, and the uh, patterns of excess deceptive words, which I'll speak about a little bit more. You can mix criteria. Uh, as you can see, you can have as many flags as you want. And then the question is, which mix of criteria is the best one? And now, What's interesting here is that by counting, what we're doing is we're transforming a text into quantitative and Boolean features that can be fed into recommender systems, classification systems, and AI. It is inadvertently a very powerful way to pre-process text for recommender systems. And one of the things that happens when you start counting is you wonder what else can you count? Uh, we counted uncertainty words and red flag names. What else can we do? Well, a lot of museums don't publish any provenance at all. So we can count a provenance gap, which is equal to the years between the creation of the item and the acquisition of the item. On the left, for example, is Virginia Museum of Fine Arts provenance gaps for paintings created before 1945. Uh, the, this museum happens not to publish any provenance. And like this, you can see the gaps, which often go to hundreds of years. If there are lots of provenances for the same artwork over time, which we saw a little earlier in the discussion, you can count the number of versions and you can count and measure the differences between the versions. Uh, if you have doubts about the references, you can count the years between the occurrence of an event and the description of event. If, for example, a dealer in 1981 is, is describing is the source for what happened in a transaction that occurred 60 years before, that's an interesting number to know. Uh, you can calculate the similarity and the proximity to other texts. And you can look at measures of excess. What is normal and what is not normal? And this, I think, is one of the interesting challenges of a quantitative approach like this, uh, because a lot of data can be overwhelming, even if it just is a, a list. Uh, you end up with a simple list. And there can be data visualizations that help us see things like what is unusual? What is normal? Like here, the, the high points, the, this hill here, that's uh, the density. That's like, what's the most common? What's the most normal? And when you see that long tail, those are the things that are unusual. So if you have, for example, the uh, artworks listed by most uncertainty flags for 
um, artworks created after 1850, you might want to know how normal is it to have that many uncertainty flags. And you can see uh, by a plot like the one on the left that if you have two or three or four uncertainty flags, that's really uncommon. That's, that's not so normal. So what are some other challenges that we um, have to deal with? Well, one is that looted art and forgeries look a lot alike when you start measuring words of deception. And this is really a problem if you're trying to identify looted art um, in order to devote resources to studying it because you don't wanna waste your time on forgeries. Um, and I don't know how to solve that particular problem. Uh, uh, another challenge is to decide which criteria are best, depending on which situation. You might not, uh, you might not have the same criteria on, a, on an artwork that's two centuries old uh, and an artwork that was created only a hundred years ago. And it also might depend on your objective, uh, objectives, what you're trying to do. The style of writing provenances changes at different times, and that's also an interesting subject of study. After um, museums around the world promised to look into and deal with Nazi looted art in the Washington Conference of 1998, what happened to the provenance style to get more or less truthful or are there more or less uh, deceptive words? Uh, these numbers that are generated, they're simply indicators. They're, they're just numbers. So even if a painting comes at the top of the list with a lot of flags, that doesn't mean that it's looted any more than having high blood pressure means that you're going to have a heart attack. It's simply an indicator, not a conclusion, and one has to keep that in mind. And as one goes, as one tries to automate further, going towards, for example, machine learning classifier systems, one really needs to have training sets that contain the provenances of looted artworks before their true history was acknowledged. So one starts with a, an artwork that's been restituted. And then one works back to see what kind of provenances people invented for it before um, it was revealed to have been looted. So next steps, there's a lot we can do uh, at the technological level. Um, this quantitative approach can be used in all of these different tools. Uh, knowledge graphs are particularly interesting, I think, because they can bring together a lot of contextual information, uh, which um, really sheds a lot of light on what's going on in the market and what's going on for a particular artwork. The whole situation has been revolutionized, I think, by these new large uh, language models, because while they're very terrible at giving accurate information, if you simply ask a question, they're unbelievably good if you give them a text at saying what is, um, deceptive language or uncertain language, um, they can actually, if you give them three texts that are written slightly differently uh, about an artwork, they can tell you which one is the most reliable and they can do it pretty well. Uh, there's also, for those who want to do advanced data visualizations but don't know how to code, uh, they, they have um, uh, advanced coding which enables you to speak with them in natural language and get, uh, as a result, a really excellent data graphics. But we don't actually need to do any of that. Uh, already just counting, we get results simply by ranking uh, these, these word counts that tell us a lot about what um, which artworks have problematic provenances. We can already tell which artworks um, really need to have closer scrutiny. And that leaves us with a different problem. What do we do with that information? Who do we tell? Who, how do we get action uh, on these artworks, which clearly um, have some kind of problem? If there's one thought I want to leave you with today, it's that in researching this rigged game, counting is a potentially powerful tool. Wow, 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 that was so impressive. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.